welcome to the Writer's Book Club podcast, where each month we take a deep dive with an author into the writing craft and process behind one of their books. I'm Michelle Barakoff, and this month I had a really brilliant chat with Tasmanian author Kyle Perry. Now, I'd heard Kyle talk about his writing process before, and he was so articulate and generous with his own experiences of writing, I knew he'd be perfect for the podcast. This chat with Kyle about his latest novel, The Deep, is everything I hoped it would be. We talked about the importance of the opening image of a novel, Kyle's trick to creating a good plot twist, how to make characters distinctive from one another, and Kyle also gives us a great example of what he did to make a couple of his characters a bit more likeable after some feedback from his sister. He also shares some great editorial notes he received from his publisher on The Deep and how he applied them, so there are some great insights there too. Now, fair warning, people, there are spoilers in this episode, and because The Deep is full of suspense and mystery, consider this your warning. If you prefer not to know anything about The Deep or any of its fantastic twists and turns, come back and listen after you've read it. And I highly recommend you do because this is a really great in-depth chat about the ins and outs of writing this book. So who is Kyle Perry? His day job is as a drug and alcohol counsellor based in Hobart, Tasmania. He's grown up around the Tasmanian bush and seas where he still spends a lot of his spare time. And those gorgeous wild landscapes are a key feature of his writing. In fact, he loves the sea so much his entire leg is covered in ocean tattoos. Kyle's debut novel, The Bluffs, has been translated into five languages. It was shortlisted for the Dimmick's Book of the Year, the Indies Debut Fiction Book of the Year and the Ned Kelly Debut Fiction Book of the Year and was long listed for the Australian Book Industry Awards General Fiction Book of the Year. That's a lot of awards, and I have no doubt The Deep will do just as well this year. I hope you enjoy listening to this interview with Kyle Perry. Hello, Kyle Perry. Welcome to the podcast. (laughs) Hello, Michelle. Thank you for having me. (laughs) It's a pleasure. I'm so pleased to have you on the show. When I was planning the guest list for the podcast, I put you on my wish list because I'd heard you talking to the novelist Ben Hobson on Danny V's Words and Nerds podcast. Mm -hmm. And you were so articulate and honest about your writing process. I thought this guy's going to be perfect (laughs) for this podcast. Um, And then you and I had a little chat last week and you were fully on board with diving a bit deeper into your process behind writing your second novel, The Deep. Thank you. And it sort of seems fitting that we should go deep on The Deep, don't you think? (laughs) Absolutely. 100%. (laughs) Now, when you were talking to Ben, you said this novel, The Deep, was a tricky beast to write. Tell me about some of the challenges it threw up for you as the second novel. First of all, I uh, should I give a spoilers disclaimer because I would love to go into yes. some spoilers. <laughs> People, you heard it up front. There will be spoilers. So, there will be spoilers. Uh, so buy the book, read the book. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't read the deep, please uh, pause and turn off your device, move away from the podcast, and go buy the book. But um, so a tricky piece to write with the bluffs. My first book, I sat down with a basic premise of girls going missing in the bush. Um, and I opened with a scene and then I just shot from the hip and I wrote from there. I didn't, I didn't plan at all. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know how it would end. I knew I wanted the hungry man in there somewhere, but I didn't know how. And I ended up having to rewrite that a bit too because the first draft of The Bluffs became a bit of a, I, I call it a B-grade thriller film. So it had like... You know, the girls were stuck in a cave. The hungry man was there. Um, there was a hero who came in with like a machete to take him out. It was unrecognisable from the bluffs we have today. With the deep, I had a different tactic in terms of I knew I wanted to have a mother's club become an ice syndicate. That was my goal with the book. And so I sat down at the start to work towards that being the ending. So with the bluffs, I had the beginning and I worked towards an ending. With the deep, I had an ending and I didn't have a beginning. So I knew where I wanted to get to, to, didn't know where I was beginning. And that did not work at all. I I wrote that book um, and I tried to force my characters into shapes that they didn't fit into. 
I tried to force um, emotional growth in characters that didn't have the capacity for it. And what I mean by that is my main character at that stage, Shelby, uh, by the end of the book, her and her mother's club had become these really high level drug players. Um, and it didn't work. I knew it didn't work, but I still set it off to my publisher. And she's like, this, this doesn't, I don't think a mum would do this, Kyle. <laughs> I don't think a group of mums would do this. I worked in a drug and alcohol rehab and I knew the stakes involved. And I knew the journeys of people to get there. Yeah. So when the book was a tricky beast, it was, I had this end goal that I was working towards and it didn't work to the point where I, I had to take her entire point of view chapters out of the book and rewrite Ouch. everything. So by pulling that out, um, I still had the other characters in there. I had Mac and Forrest, but I didn't have Ahab at that stage, my third character. And so I pulled her out. There's 60,000 words. What was left over was maybe 40,000 words. And I just had to try and madly weave these threads back together into some form of story. Um, what was useful is uh, my publisher, she she kind of encouraged me to focus on the male characters because I write them pretty damn good <laughs> as opposed <laughs> to the female characters that I struggle with. And so I focused on Mac and his journey and just weaved in the story around his character arc. Um, so what I learned from that was not for me and my process, I can't just come in with this vague idea of the ending and hope for the best. Um, and it was a good learning definitely a good learning process for me and I don't plot really I don't um the extent of my plotting is I know where I want the ending to be mm -hmm. but I reckon every chapter that that goal change so you know if I write a chapter you know thinking that this is going to end on a boat in the middle of the sea um and I'm I'm working towards that and then I get to a certain chapter and I think actually I think I'd rather this end on a beach um, with this character instead. And so my, my book's always, you know, listeners can't see this, I'm doing like zigzags with my hands. <laughs> my, my book will, will zigzag depending on where I've placed the goalposts. Um, and that made it so tricky, especially with it being the second book on the back of such huge success. Yeah. So. You say you write better male characters than female characters, but um, excuse me. <laughs> Fluffs had some pretty amazing female characters in it. And can I just say The Deep has two incredible female characters in it as well. So I'm just going to dispute your assertion that you don't write good female characters. I mean, I, I write, like I, I write them, I write them okay. I don't, I needed a lot of help. Yeah. But I guess it's just, I can write male characters really easy. And so by comparison, sometimes my female characters seem a bit like their decisions don't make as much sense. Right. Um, you'll notice my male characters are pretty in the middle of the road, whereas my female characters are quite ends of the bell curve. <laughs> so writing normal female cat, like not normal, but like, you know, yeah. your, your, your average middle of the bell curve female characters, I do struggle with. So you'd come off the incredible wave that was The Bluffs, your wildly successful debut novel. Um, side note, congratulations on the shortlisting for the Ned Kelly Award as well. That was Thank you very much. just an award piled on massive commercial success. So how great. And you had the deep written and in the bag and four months off release when you were talking to, to Ben and you were back in the trenches grappling with novel number three. Mm -hmm. um, are you still grappling with novel number three or where's that up to? I'm very much grappling with novel number three. Um, I think I didn't give myself enough space to really let it become what it wants to be. Book three has been a very different um, creature as well because I feel it, I feel book three kind of swelling inside of me. Um, it's the only way I can describe it. I can kind of feel when I think about book three, it's like I can, I can actually feel it almost, yeah, swelling is the best word, like lifting up out of my chest. Mm. Um, I've never had that before with a story. Okay. And so I'm a much more, it's kind of like I'm trying to not startle a bird with this book, I'm going <laughs> quite slow, gentle, not letting myself just run off ahead like I usually do and just let it kind of grow, which has been a much slower process, which brings its own stresses when you've got deadlines. Um, 
but it's, I feel good. I feel so much. I feel better that, about book three than I did about book one and two. So I'm really, I'm, I'm, I've got high expectations. Oh, that's great. So that kind of grappling with the deep led you to thinking, well, why don't I try and plan novel number three? And I believe that involved some sticky notes, which I can still see plastered to the wall behind you. Um, And at the time, you weren't completely loving the process. But how has that evolved for you, this planning? And has that planning aspect uh, helped alleviate some of the the prior tricky beastness of the writing process? It hasn't, it hasn't. Um, I, I plotted um, because I didn't want to waste time again, like I did with The Deep, those 60,000 words being removed. I didn't want to do that again. I didn't have time. I didn't have, I just didn't think my heart could take it again. So what I did was I got a bunch of books about plotting and that were like militant about plotting. I wanted books. I didn't want Stephen King, who I read his book, and he's like, don't plot if you don't have to, which is what I've been living <laughs> off. And I thought, thank you, Stephen. You're very, you, you're a man after my own heart. Like, this is exactly how I work, but I'm going to try something different. So let me find some other um, books that will tell me um, exactly how to plot, what it will look like. And so... One of those books is Blake Snyder's Save the Cat, which is all about script writing. And I'll go into some of, like later on, we can talk a bit more about how much of an effect that book had on me because it did teach me some great writing techniques. But he has a really um, pretty strict plotting uh, outline where he has actual um, story beats that you have to write to. And it's like the first one is the opening image. And he says the opening image always has to reflect the closing image and it sets up the scene for the whole book. So, for example, with The Deep, originally the opening scene was um, a forest was handcuffed to a lookout up on one of the cliffs. And this was because I wanted my um, one of my final scenes to be up on a cliff as well. It's kind of similar to the climax in The Bluffs. I wanted a cliff scene in the ocean crashing um wind and waves and so he opened handcuff to a lookout um and then my editor actually he came back and said look i feel like he needs to start in the ocean like this is an ocean book and that's just when this thing that blake snyder had said about opening image became even more real to me i thought you're exactly right this is the introduction the reader has to this work he's talking about movies but when it comes to books all right this is the, the introduction that the reader has to this, this whole theme. It needs to reflect the theme of the book. And so we changed it to have forest coming out of the ocean. So when I'm plotting for book three, I've got like an index card that says opening image. The thing is, I still don't really know what the book's about. So how do I make an opening image? I don't know necessarily where this book is going. And so it's not really fair of me to put an opening image in now because I know it's just going to change. Um, and so that's where plotting gets a bit confusing for me because I know with book three, I've got all these different themes I want to explore and I feel like the opening image should start in the bush. But I don't want to start my opening image because I know it will change. And the way that I work is I spend, I reckon, a third of my time on the opening three chapters when I'm writing. Like, the, like a third of my whole time lifespan of the book will be on the opening. I'm just so like obsessive about openings. Is that because of your own reading history or it's just as this has just come about as you've been writing, you've just gone, right, I've got to get this right before I can move on? Yeah, it's that kind of thing. How I write is um, kind of a bit like building a wall brick by brick. And so I always feel like I need to go back to the bottom and just check this, check the structural integrity. And I did read a quote once um, about writing, and I wish I could find it because it, it sums it up really well, puts language to it. And they talked about how some writers are like me in that they will spend heaps of time on the opening and they'll get that so crisp and they'll use that to be like the momentum that carries them through. And this, this, quote writer was commenting on the fact that you can tell those because the opening is like crisp 
well oiled and you can kind of see the transition where it goes from opening to the rest of the book um and he said it's still good it's fine but you can tell and then he said there's other people that divide their time evenly across the whole kind of span of the book and he said you can tell they're different as well and i and i remember it sticking with me because that's definitely how i work i will spend so much time on the opening i'll spend so much time obsessively trying to work out how i can get my reader immediately hooked Mm. how i can get them um, introduced to the characters how i can get them brought into the story and and so that can look like um all right, are we going to meet the main character first up? Or are we going to meet the main plot tension straight up? Are we going to be introduced to a secret relating to the to the landscape? Um, are we going to meet a character in the opening that we never see again? Like it's lots of different ways to craft suspense. And when I'm writing the opening, I've got all of them in the back of my head. And I think another reason plotting doesn't work for me, and this is something that, I'm only just starting to learn, and it's really good for you writers out here to know that character is king, not, not plot. Um, character, what I've learned from the way people have responded to my books is character is is the first thing that's you need to get right. Mm. And I'm lucky that my plots are interesting. My plots have lots of twists and turns. Writing plots comes quite easily to me. Yeah. Um, the character stuff I had to work on really, really hard um in terms of i i was just making stuff up whereas i wasn't letting it come to me then there is a difference and with my characters i was constantly just making stuff up because i thought what's the best character to serve this plot and so i would plot everything out and think all right this is what my character is going to do here here and here but now i'm at a stage with book three where i actually know my characters finally so I need to go back and replot it because now I actually know the characters first. So I've got my characters, now I'll plot rather than the other way around. Okay, so will you then go back to the Save the Cat uh, beats for that? I, I'll i look at them. Mm. <laughs> I'll look at them. Um, and I will try and make a decision on if it's going to confuse me, then no. Yeah. Because, um, again, it's, it's script writing. It's not book writing. Mm. But... I will definitely um, keep in mind the emotional clockwork that goes into um, the Save the Cat beat sheet. Yeah. Yeah, just to keep the story moving. Yeah, just to just to to kind of make sure the the dips in the dips in mountains are in the right place. Yeah. So, just on that, with multiple points of view do you tend to look at that kind of beat sheet and say well i need to hit those beats for each character or is that more hitting the beats of the overall plot because the beats are tied into the character arc aren't they Mm -hmm. and each of your characters sort of has equal time yes (laughs) that's where it gets tricky right (laughs) you've nailed it that's exactly right um I mean, at the end of the day, and Blake Snyder says this, every every story should somehow either be, it's about a guy who, or it's about a girl who, it needs to be about someone. Mm. So when I talk about The Deep, I always say it's about a guy called Mac. Even though Forrest and Ahab have just as much airtime, mm. the emotional heart of the book and everyone's, well, the majority of people's favourite character is Mac and his journey. So... When I was writing the book, he was the main character arc I was working on. And you can see that. He's, he's has yeah. the most significant growth. Forrest's growth is also quite significant, whereas he brings a lot more um, of a shapeshifter, kind of trickster archetype to the mm. book. And so that his character arc is there, but it's in a much more roundabout way, much more subtle way, which is great because, you know, people love that. And it's Mm. part of, he's the catalyst, he's the energy that drives the book. You know, he's the person that kicks off the story. Um, He's the one kind of calling the shots at the start, which which gets everyone else onto their character journeys. Things get out of hand for him, which is normal for these characters. And then at the end, 
you realize that, oh, wow, he was Forrest all along. He was pretending, he was just pretending to be Forrest. And then you find out he actually is Forrest. And so there's this moment for the reader where they realize, wow, I was reading a whole different book than the yeah. one I thought I was reading, yeah. which is awesome. Like I'm so, I'm so proud of myself and the team around me to achieve that. I loved that. I did not see that coming. You took us on a merry ride, Kyle. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, oh, maybe this isn't Forrest. Maybe he isn't who he claims to be. And then sure enough, he's not. And then at the end, whoa, what? What? He actually is, yeah. So he provided also a, a vehicle for that wonderful plot twist. Yeah, yeah. And part of the reason you wouldn't have seen it coming is because one thing I try to do is to have a semi-obvious plot twist that make that lull readers into a false sense of security um, to think, all right, the plots, the plot twists are done now. Um, because if you, if I didn't have any other plot twists, you probably would have kind of been thinking it. Yeah. I've actually had one of my, um, w- one of my readers, one of my friends, she's reading it, but she's not up to the scene in the cave where you realize, you know, in the book, oh, wow, Huck is actually Forrest. Um, so at the moment, she's telling me, she's saying, oh, okay, I think this guy actually is Forrest. He's just forgotten. So she's onto it. But I reckon as soon as she gets to that plot twist, she'll be like, oh, I was wrong. And she'll forget it, you know. So when it comes to the end, it's another surprise. It's just a little technique for plot twists is to put in a couple at the start that are really good, really groundbreaking, but that divert your reader. And that was what I did with Eliza in The Bluffs. Yeah. Again, spoiler alert, if you haven't read The Bluffs, please <laughs> walk away now. Um, and I really but, hope that friend of yours is not listening. <laughs> that's, that's, no, oh, that's a good point, actually. No, I said spoilers. She wouldn't listen. Yeah, Warner. Warner. <laughs> Send her a text. <laughs> um, with The Bluffs, I had uh, Eliza, obviously, was the person responsible. Um, and I, at the start, I made her out to be pretty, you know, she's suspicious. And then what I did was I chucked in this allegation that her and Sierra were sleeping together. Mm. Um, and so, and then obviously that gets resolved. You realize that wasn't true, but I put that in there intentionally so that people who were suspicious of Eliza would think, ah, oh, that's why she was suspicious. All right. She's not suspicious anymore. It was an intent, like it was strategic to make people kind of in, in books, you'll find that someone will be suspicious until they're cleared. And then they're not part of the, they're not on the lineup anymore. Mm. Whereas with my books, I'm like, no, just because they're not suspicious on this thing doesn't mean that they're, they're always going to be not suspicious. You know what I mean? Yeah. This technique, did this just come to you or had you read a novel where that had happened and you thought, ah, oh, that's how I can that's how I can bring this twist on a twist in? No, that, that's my twist. That was my that's, idea. That's, that's your my, idea. Yeah, that'll go in my writing book one day. <laughs> um, and I think I noticed it from watching crime shows especially like Bones, um, I'd watch it with mum and I could always tell who was going to be the culprit because they would be a suspect and then they'd have some kind of reason for being dismissed as a suspect. But it wasn't like a watertight reason. It was just yeah. like a random reason. Like they'd say, oh, it wasn't me, but have you tried this person? Like a, a really overt misdirection. And I'd be like, it's them. And get to the end of it, and sure enough, it's them. I just had a really good instinct, okay. which is part of the reason I wanted to go into writing crimes because I loved that that part of it. Yeah. So when you sit down to write a chapter or a scene, what's going through your mind? Do you think about what a scene needs to achieve? And if so, what are those things? Primarily at the start, I'm just looking for word count um, because done is better than good. I love that saying, Elizabeth Gilbert. Is that where it's come from? Okay, yeah. good. It's actually Elizabeth Gilbert's mother. Her mother used to say, done is better than good. Good. I heard it from Anna Downs, author oh, of The right. Safe Place. Yeah, right. And, I've, and I've, I've swore by it ever since. Yeah, it's so good for writers to have that mantra. And the, I also heard another podcast, I think it was on Joe Rogan. I can't remember who the guest was because I've tried to refine it and haven't had any luck. But he talks about how to trust yourself to sit down and merely do the work. That's um, just merely do the work and, you know, it'll come, it'll, it'll be fine. And I, and I use that when I sit down and I, I try not to think too much. I just merely do the work when I'm first writing a scene because I am, what I do is I'm a real like editor mindset. 
um, I, I, I go back heaps and rewrite heaps. So my plan always is just to get as much content on the page I can work with and then go back and shape it. I find it much easier to shape stuff that's already on the page than to um, try and shape it as it's coming out. Um, part of that is because writing uh, for me is my flow state. Okay. And so a flow state is that therapeutic space that everyone has where they're in the zone. So for some people, their flow state is music or running or cooking or craft. It's generally something kind of, there's got to be a level of skill versus challenge. And there's a certain, there's like a, a, there's like a calculation you work out where your skill is just equal to the challenge to get you into the flow state. And so writing is my flow state, which means there's not much time for strategy. It's just more instinctual, creative flow. Sit down and I get it out. But in terms of crafting a scene, um, it's always uh, I'm focusing on specific details to orient the reader to set time and place. Because to really honor your reader's time, you want to make the setting as accessible as possible. You don't want your reader to not know where they are, what they're looking at. And it doesn't need to be like specifics, but it's a tricky um, art in just getting across the sense of where you're at. So, you know, you don't have to say that, you know, that the couch is blue, but you need to say the couch is comfy because the, the comfiness is what gives the reader that sense of being there. They can feel that. And, and even though writing is 100% visual and we try to pretend it's not, but it absolutely is, you know, mm. you, you, you're always going to emphasize visual description over anything else because as people, that's what we do. But it's also, you've got a lot of other senses um, and particularly emotional senses. And so when you're describing the, the setting, you need to bring in some kind of um, orientation that your reader can grasp in a deeper emotional sense. And, and I find temperature does that pretty well. Um, the kind of, if you're, if you're writing from closed person point of view, like I am, um, how my readers responding to certain things or where it takes their mind. You know, if, if, if Ahab's looking at the ocean and he's thinking about diving, then immediately my readers gonna have that same kind of sense as well. They're gonna feel a little bit cold. They're gonna feel a little bit of like longing to get in the water. They're gonna feel a little bit like, okay, it's going to be a bit of physical exertion and the body responds to that. You know, our, our, our sympathetic nervous system is, is responding to that. So I'm sitting down, I'm flowing. I've got my setting in, in my, in my mind and I've got my character. And if I don't know my character at that stage, that's okay. If I don't know what they would do in this situation, that's all right. I don't overthink it. I just write some words in there for what I think they might say. Because invariably, Michelle, <laughs> invariably, my character changes. Okay. So I write this first draft. I finally got a, a sense of my character. I go back to the start and I almost rework the whole thing now that I know who my character is, which means all the dialogue can change. And even that can be quite frustrating because with Forrest, um, originally he was very closed, which is, which is fine. You know, he wasn't giving much at all. Um, and so when he was doing dialogue, he wasn't really, there was no personality, which was realistic, but my editor identified that that wasn't giving the reader much to go with. So in the first draft or even more like one of the later drafts of the deep forest, just wasn't likable in any single way because the reader just couldn't access it. People, you know, Mac would ask forest questions and forest would give one word answers. You know, um, Ivy would try to engage Forrest in conversation and Forrest would have all his guards up. For me, this was realistic, but for the reader and their experience, it was just not, they couldn't get in. They couldn't yeah. get to know him. It's hard to believe because I feel like I did really know and empathise with, with Forrest. Well, because, yeah, yeah so, that, so I had to go back through yeah. and I had to open him up, yeah. which was very tricky to do because I had to have him um, traumatised kid that needed to come across to make the reveal at the end realistic. Um, and also I needed him just to kind of be moody and surly, but a moody and surly character is not likable. And if your character isn't likable, then you've lost your readers. Um, so that was that what, what I then had to do was go back through the book and change things Forrest was saying. But by changing things Forrest was saying, 
that was changing the next scene. It was changing the plot. Because if he got in there and, you know, he came to Mac and um, Mac's like, why did you come here? And Forrest didn't give him anything. You know, he's like, oh, you know, I'm not going to tell you. This was, um, so the scene I'm talking about is where Forrest first comes out of the hospital um, and he goes straight to Mac's house. And Mac's like, why did you come here? And Forrest was like, I'm not going to tell you. And this was my attempt to build suspense, to have the reader be like, oh, why is he there with Mac? Mac wants to know why he's there. Which is cool. Yep, that's a great technique. But as a character, Forrest is now unlikable because I'm giving no one anything. No one's getting a reward from reading his words. Mm. So I changed that for him to be like, I came here because you're the only one I can trust. And immediately there's more emotional depth. Immediately you feel drawn into the character. You know a bit more about Forrest. You know a bit more about Mac. And more importantly, you actually like the kid now because of the way he's just made Mac feel. Yeah, because he really plays into Mac's insecurity as well. Yeah. And and so by going to Mac, Mac feels important in a way that he hasn't felt important for a long time because he's, you know, he's out on parole and he's got no place in the town anymore and he's been shunned by his family. And so this kid coming to him uh, makes him feel worthy. So mm. that adds a lot to his character development. Which then changed the next scene. So the next scene after that was like Mac was suddenly, rather than, why well, is Forrest here? I don't know. It was, he's standing a bit taller. He's like, his chest, his chest's a bit puffed yeah. out. Forrest, trust me. Which then changed the whole rest of the flipping book. You know, like it just, <laughs> little things like that, they, they make a big difference. And yeah. to do them well, you have to put in the work and make sure the rest of the story um, pays homage to that. Kyle, I reckon we should read the start of Chapter 8, which is, Forrest's first section in the main narrative because it really illustrates what you were saying about mm. getting a reader into the scene but also it's a great demonstration of how you've drawn the reader into caring about Forrest and there's a dog which helps. <laughs> there's a dog. I mean I was just looking at this first page and I just reckon it's great because he's talking to the mm. dog it just saves him from always having that internal mo monologue yeah and it gives also what it does is, is it gives a sense that he's not alone because I, as a reader I much prefer a page that has more than one character doing something I find I don't like that sense of loneliness I always want connection so sure we'll read from chapter eight Forrest stood at the window of his hospital room still in his gown watching the cars on the street below. He'd woken from a restless sleep to find it was early evening. He rested an arm against the frame, deep in thought. Exhaustion dragged at his body. The world felt like it was tumbling around him, like he was still in the ocean. I'm in over my head now, Zeus, he said. Zeus lay asleep on Forrest's bed. At first, the authorities had wanted to put the dog in a kennel, but Dr. Joseph had agreed his companionship would be good for Forrest provided the dog didn't leave the room and enter the rest of the hospital. Forrest was grateful Dr. Joseph had intervened. The hospital room, as nice as it was, felt like a prison. Uniformed police waited outside to protect him, they said. There was a knock and a nurse entered. Hi, Forrest, she said. How are we feeling? Fine, thank you, he said. He sat down in the chair, holding out his arm so she could check his blood pressure. How are you? That's excellent. I love the start of that chapter because I think it really, first of all, does exactly what you just were talking about in terms of getting into a scene. We know he's in a hospital room. We get that he's feeling a little bit trapped. It alludes to what he's been through, where he was found tumbling in the ocean. But you've also got the dog in there, which gives Forrest a way of articulating his thoughts without it being a constant inner monologue. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the articulating the thoughts wasn't the strategy behind it. That was just a really happy consequence. <laughs> I was aware that the story of Forrest is very bleak. Um, and it's intentionally bleak because it's based on true things that, you know, I've seen and heard stories of in my job as a counselor and a, and a case manager in the rehab. So I wanted to give forest some sense of warmth about the energy he brings to the page i wanted forest to have a companion i wanted to him him to have a connection to 
the natural world. I wanted someone to always be on his side because alliances change throughout the book and I needed Forrest to have a, a safe harbour. I needed him to have a, a steady bearing. When I wrote The Bluffs, wrote the whole thing, had all the characters in place, and then I was going back through layering um, more description about uh, landscape and about how the, the houses looked. And when I was doing that, I realised that, where are the pets? There's no <laughs> pets in this book. And I've had pets my whole life. Like, I've got a pet on my lap right this second, you know? And I thought, why have I not put animals in here? Like, I was so focused on my people, I forgot about everything else. So I just layered in all these pets into the bluffs, and it made it so much better. So, and realistic, really. And I, I don't, you don't read about pets that often in books, I find. Like, if you go out there and read some, some Aussie noir, you struggle to find one with house pets. So with The Deep, I thought, well, I'm going to have some dogs in there and they're going to bring some real nice stuff to the page because I know that people love reading about dogs. Yeah. And, and I love reading about dogs. So advice to writers, put pets in your books because <laughs> it will lift up the energy of the story and your readers will love it. And also it provides a device for characters to uh, articulate some feelings. Yeah. And you can hear their voice and it's just everyone talks to their animals, you know, it's normal. Yeah. So is that an example of the start of a chapter where you would have gone back and thought, no, I haven't really anchored the reader in time and place here. So you'll write a scene and then you'll go back the next day. Or do you write the whole thing, sit down, do the whole thing, done is better than good, and then go back and edit the whole book? Or do you sort of edit as you go? I will. I kind of edit as I go. Mm. Um Sometimes, I mean, I do all of it. I, I I find it healthy. It's kind of like working out. You need to change it up all the time. If you just do the same workouts all the time, you don't grow your muscles because mm-hmm. they get used to it. And it's the same with creativity. If you just keep do, doing the same thing all the time, your creativity gets stagnant. So I do change it up. I'm very loud and proud about changing it up. With this scene, it wouldn't have changed much because I knew I could picture that that hospital room in my head. I can picture him standing at the window looking down. What would have changed is the way he responded to the nurse. So you notice in the scene I just read out there, it he says back, how are you? Like he actually asked a question. He invites a conversation. Whereas previous Forrest didn't do that. He's like, no, as minimal interaction as possible. So while this, the scene wouldn't change, later on the dialogue definitely did, which changed the interaction of the book. Can we talk about characters for a moment? The characters yes. in the deep have very strong, distinctive voices. How do you find the voice for each character and how do you go about differentiating them? Voice is something that I find comes to me quite easy, bearing in mind that I wrote 10 manuscripts before I ever got published. So I've had a very long apprenticeship with this. Part of that also comes from my training as a counsellor in building rapport and so to build rapport there's lots of different techniques we use both consciously and 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 subconsciously and one of those is mirroring and so if someone's standing across from me um, in the rehab you get all sorts so you can get university trained professionals and you can get 18 year olds who've never completed past grade you know six and as soon as they sit in this in the chair you get them talking and you very quickly hook into their their manner of speaking and you mirror it. So I employ that same technique when I'm writing a character in that hey, what goes on in my head is I picture Mac in front of me, I picture how he would talk, and I just mirror that as I'm writing, as though I'm, I'm meeting him where he's at. So the dialogue um, comes to me quite easy, but I will admit that with writing The Deep, I used what I did well in The Bluffs as a bit of a kind of a kernel to begin with. So um, Ahab was pretty, originally he, he was kind of the kernel of, of Con. So he kind of spoke the same way that Con did in The Bluffs, my detective. He, mm. he had the same kind of almost vocal mannerisms. And then I went through later on and I thought, all right, let's make it different. And I build him up a bit more and I kind of added another layer with the gruffness, with the sense of justice to the point where it's unrecognisable from Con because 
um, we've got different voices in our head and, and, and you can, they come naturally to you. So use them and then later on go through and make sure that they're distinctive. What is also helpful for me is I've got a whole team of I've got my publisher and my editor who read my work and they can identify when, you know, characters are blending in. So having other people read your work is the, you know, it's the number one rule of being, becoming a better writer. But in terms of um, trying to keep a distinctive flavor on the page, I, again, I'm just really aware of emotion. Okay. I'm a very emotional writer. I want my readers to know what emotion's going on and I want my characters to be feeling an emotion and I want to be feeling the emotion. And so when I'm writing Mac at the start, um, and I'm picturing him at the start as the outcast, he's adrift, he's very self-conscious. I can adopt that in my own body. I can inhabit that like a character. I can picture him as a client. I can think about, well, like where, how would I talk to a client feeling that way to make them feel like I know what they're going through? When I'm writing him, I can feel like my own shoulders hunching a bit. I can feel my own kind of desire to please people. And so when you come from that space, the spirit that you write in is the spirit that goes out with the words, um, regardless of how strategic you are with word choice. It, it's all about the spirit, the heart that you're writing in is what's going to go out with those words. And the moment you feel like it's becoming bland or one-dimensional, that's when you just have a break from the page or you just keep writing it through and edit it later. Like it doesn't, there's no right or wrong way to do it, but being, being aware of it is a bloody good sign. Yeah. So, with your characters, do you tend to think about them before you put pen to paper and think about what their wound might be, for example, and what their, their character arc is going to be and what their demeanour and their actions and their dialogue is all going to bounce off? So Ahab, he doesn't take any crap, you know, and he's sort of like the elder statesman of the family, but he's also risen above the dirty stuff that the family's doing. So had you worked out in your mind before you started writing, well, this is because of his experience when he was a kid and how he's grown as a person? No, I didn't know why, but I knew I wanted him to be the moralistic character. Yeah, right. I knew that Mac, by the end of it, was going to be extremely moralistic, but I knew at the start there was going to be dubious grounds and my readers would be left adrift. I knew Forrest was a shapeshifter and a trickster, um, and so no one could feel safe with him. So I needed a character who people would feel safe with. And, and historically, that's the detective character. Um, so like in, in The Bluffs, Con is that safe character, really. Mm -hmm. So in um, The Deep, I wanted to bring that same energy to Ahab to make him moralistic, righteous. What I struggled with so much was, okay, if he's moralistic, why the heck doesn't he just go to the police and, and blow the, the lid off his racket? Yeah. Um, I know because in that world, that's like the last thing you do. You, you never rat, you never roll on people. But my readers aren't going to, it's not going to fly with them. So it took me a little while to decide on the fact that, okay, if he's moralistic and he never breaks a promise, then I just need him to have made a promise that he wouldn't tell on his family. And that's when I brought in his mum. To that point, his mum wasn't actually that she didn't really feature that much. I thought, no, I'm not going to bring in another character. Like, I'm not going to layer this. Um, but I thought, well, he needs to promise someone who matters to him. Otherwise, my readers aren't going to believe that he's this moralistic and not telling the, the authorities, mm. which worked really well because then, you know, she became the witch that, you know, helped Forrest out yeah. and made sure to link them together. But originally, it was just so that he had a reason to be moral. Um, and, and a reason that readers could latch on to. Because I, if you didn't have that reason, he'd still be moral. Um, it just, readers would ask questions. Yeah. Um, it, it, the, the, if some readers can read stuff and they're, the, they're just happy, they're happy, like, yep, I trust, the, I trust the writer knows what he's doing here. I trust that there's a reason for moralistic. And then there's other readers that are like, you know. Why? They want to know, they want to dive deep, yeah. they want to understand. And I'm more the first one. I don't really, I'll just you don't post question? on top of a book. No, nah, well, because I know, I know how complicated people are. 
that's my that's my yeah, job. Yeah, that's your job. Yeah. Like I I know that people do heaps of things without reasons. I know that I do things without reasons. Um, if I have a bad night's sleep, I'm going to be different from the person who has a good night's sleep. You know, it's normal. Whereas when it comes to fiction, there's certain expectations that there's a like almost a <laughs> there's a really there's an art to um, justifying decisions. Um, because we wouldn't have felt as empathetic towards Ahab if we didn't know that backstory. I think that gives him a real depth. I think it really adds to the emotional tug of the novel. Yeah, it it, it makes it it makes it complete. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, touching on the editing process, can you take us through the editorial process for the deep? Um, specifically, any notes that you received and how you applied them yeah is that so, a, that's a big ask i know <laughs> <laughs> yes. but we said we'd go deep kyle yeah no I, I love talking about this stuff and i think it's uh, if i was a writer this is the stuff i'd love to know so i wrote the first draft and i sent it off to my publisher and the notes i got back was just kind of very Kyle, um, I know you really want to write about drug mums, <laughs> but it's just, I just don't know how we're going to make it work. And then she put in a comment there, like, it's almost like they could have their own story. And then she put in brackets, I'm not joking. And she, Ali is amazing. She's like, you know, she's like my fairy godmother. She's like my second mum. She's very, very um, in tune with with what makes a good story. And she's very gracious to me. She's like, okay, well, if you want this, then we'll support you. But I could read between the lines. And what she was saying was, Kyle, this is not working. And it would be better if these were in another book. And so I called her on the phone and, um, and she's like, oh, you know, how did that, how did that email find you? And I said, Ali, if they're not working, they're not working. We'll take them out of the book. And, and she's like, oh, that is not the response I expected. <laughs> Because because originally this was the whole reason I wanted to write this book was this premise, and she knew that. So she thought I would be much more precious about it. And, I mean, you know, it hurt because it was what I wanted to write. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, I'm writing for my readers. I'm not writing for myself. I'm, I'm, I'm honouring the people who read The Bluffs and who loved it and are asking for another book. I want to give them the same experience, and that's important to me. And I'm also not naive, naive enough to think that, if I think something's working doesn't necessarily mean it is. So that was the first kind of feedback that came back that meant I had to change everything. Um, Other editing notes came back about the way the book ended. So originally, even with the current version we have, it gets to the end with Shelby taking over Blackbeard's drug outfit. Um, And even in like later edits, the final scene was an epilogue with Shelby and Davey on an island in Indonesia with like a drug fortress getting um, plastic surgery to change their looks. And so they had, rather than Max shooting Davey and Shelby going to hospital, they succeeded. They got away. And the story I wanted to tell was, you know, it's kind of that almost that it was a happy ending for everyone. You know, Shelby and Davey got to be international criminals and and uh, Mac and Forrest and Ahab got to keep their town and, and live happily ever after. And and Ali and some other readers were like, what is the moral of this story that good the bad guys get away with it? And because I was working in the rehab at the time, my outlook was quite bleak in terms of I was just surrounded by people getting away with it. Yeah. And I thought, well, it's just realistic. But the feedback was that this is not a satisfying emotional conclusion. So that meant I had to change the ending. So that as an edit note, was quite exciting to get, really, because I enjoy cha- making big changes, if I'm being honest. I'm like, okay, cool, we need to make that ending different. And another edit note, which I think, I mean, these are the broad ones at the start for the mm-hmm. editing process, before we go into, like, the deeper deeper dive, nitty-gritty edits. But this one came from Ali at the start, where she's like, we want to love someone in this book, because... Again, for me, I loved Mac because I knew him, because I worked with him in the rehab. But other readers aren't necessarily that sympathetic to drug dealers. Society as a whole 
has very limited sympathy for people rehabilitating from drug addiction. We're still, society generally sees it as a moral issue. And so they're like, oh, well, you have a moral failing. It's your own fault. So my sister read, um, I guess, probably that draft. And she's like, well, I don't want to read about drug dealers, Kyle. Like, I'm don't, I don't like any of these characters. Where's your female character? And I'm like, I had to get rid of my female character. <laughs> uh, the drug dealing uh, mums. <laughs> So this was when I made sure to really employ Blake Snyder's um, save the cat technique. And so for listeners who aren't aware, one of Blake Snyder's tenets is that every character needs to have a save the cat moment, which is where they do something small like save a cat, which gets the reader on board with them. Now, in my book, Max save the cat moments happened at the end because at the start he didn't really interact with enough people to have a save the cat moment. So what I did was I put in at the start, um, originally in that draft, he went down to Hobart to a um, shopping mall and he saw a fight and he tried to break it up and then his PTSD got triggered and Shelby had to come rescue him. So it, it gave Mac as this person who, who goes and, and steps in, intervenes at his own detriment, which makes you want to like him. Um, but then that that a whole scene got cut because my editor was like, why are we in Hobart? Like, <laughs> there's no reason for them to go shopping in Hobart. So that scene got cut, which lost that Save the Cat moment, which was in the draft my sister read, which then meant she didn't like Mac because there was nothing at the start to endear us to him. So then I went through the start and I thought, where's an opportunity to display a Save the Cat moment? And it came in the very first pages where he's talking to the other guy, who has to sign in at the police station and he, he just makes kind of an internal monologue where he says, well, no one spends any time talking to this guy. So he makes an effort every day to talk to him because he recognizes this guy's lonely. Just that single moment is enough to bring the reader on side with him. And then it goes further. He's really polite to the pharmacist. And then it goes further where he's like, he's smiling, even though people are like, you know, spitting on the ground as he walks by. And then he's in bed just trying to say, I'm trying. Can anyone see I'm trying? Hmm. That's, you know, such an emotional journey for the reader because now this recovering drug addict who's just come out of prison, most people aren't naturally going to have any sympathy for them. Suddenly the reader's got sympathy because they've seen him be nice to someone who doesn't need to be. They've seen him be polite to someone, you know, who's obviously likes him. They've seen him be resilient in the face of people putting him down. And then they've seen him overtly say, I am trying really hard. And, and, and without, without those four things, the book would be so much different because readers would just be like, I do not care one whit about Mac. And that's the unfortunate truth. Yeah. Do you think the villains need to have Save the Cat moments or do we not need to feel empathy towards the villains? Villains, villains are tricky and the answer is I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't. Ivy doesn't have a Save the Cat moment, really. No, she? no one... No, and she doesn't. And, I mean, Madison in Bluffs doesn't have one. Um, Jesse doesn't in the deep. Jesse doesn't have one. Do you think we need to have somebody that we just love to hate? It's definitely a theme in my books. Mm. And I've, I noticed that because people make comment of it in reviews. They're like, oh, he writes characters we just love to hate. Yeah. Um, I think it's it would be interesting, like a, a lot of writers – like um, Snyder, like I've been listening to Masterclass, 100% recommend Masterclass to any writers out there, um, the app. It's it's pretty pricey. It's like 300 a year, which, I mean, isn't that pricey in the scheme of things. But it's got all these writing lessons and they're pure gold. Yeah, which of the writers do you recommend? Well, on there, I'll open the app right now and I'll tell you, because the one I'm thinking of is is Dan Brown who talks about the villain having shades of grey. Ah, oh, yes. Because all his his villains have shades of grey. Um, and I listened to it and I actually disagreed with him. I thought, well, I don't know. Ah. I don't really – none of my characters have shades of grey. They're pretty overtly evil because I, I like the idea of dark versus light. But the ones that I'm listening to, Judy Bloom was amazing um, when she taught writing about emotional connection. Um Dan Brown was great for thriller writing. I'm listening to N.K. Jim Jemison at the moment about fantasy and science fiction writing. Yeah. And hers is a really nice reflection on 
um, she just has really smart stuff to say about psychology and science fiction and the intersection. Um, I really liked Issa Rae when she talked about um, writing about what you know. Um, and David Baldacci had some great had some great examples of how to write um, kind of compelling action scenes. So I just I recommend it. I've been every writer I know I've been saying you need two things in life. You need masterclass and you need a ergonomic keyboard. I think masterclass run about twice a year. They run a kind of a two for the price of one deal that I know a lot of writers share amongst them. So oh, yeah, that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, a, that's awesome. There's a hot tip, people. If you want to join masterclass, just keep an eye on their biannual specials. <laughs> and they give you specific writing examples and uh, exercises like, to do, yeah, don't they? Like workbooks and stuff. Yeah, workbooks, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's good value. Very good value. Um, Kyle, I remember you asked a question for my chat with Candace Fox around using specific and unique character moments inspired by real stories as a way of adding credibility. Can you tell us any of your own that made it into the deep and why this kind of specificity is important in fiction? Yeah, I'll give, for example, um, so part of the reason Forrest goes into drug psychosis uh, is because he was unwillingly injected with ice as a kid. Um, and that story actually came from Catherine Firkin, okay. who is another crime writer. Um, and she talked about hearing that when she was like a court reporter. And that was just like, wow, that's incredible. And I hear pretty similar stories about kids um, being made to smoke ice as um, in the rehab, they would tell like, oh yeah, when I was a kid, you know, my dad made me smoke ice. Yeah. So that that came into it. Um, other specifics. So Mac, the character of Mac is based on a an actual friend of mine that I met through the rehab, who had the exact same bowel conditions. So he had the daily sign in every single day, which is a rare, to, for a daily signing is quite rare. You have to have done something pretty bad to be on a daily signing, not bad, but you know, pretty criminal. Mm. Um, he also had the you nightly know, curfew, obviously, and he had to get his, his meds from the pharmacist every morning, which I hadn't actually had a client before who had to go to the pharmacist to get his pain meds before. Right. So every single day, my friend has to go to the pharmacist, get his pain meds, because he's not allowed to have them in his house. and. I thought that was such a really unique challenge and it really sets the scene. I had apes in there about laundering ice. Um, when we talk about the, in the book, they cook ice and mm. that's actually based on a proper ice making recipe. There's a lot <laughs> of detail in that, Kyle. <laughs> Just quietly, I thought, oh, he's yeah. obviously talking to somebody who knows how to cook this yeah. stuff up there was more detail but my my publisher made me remove it <laughs> so you actually you can't read that book and think oh i know how to make ice now because it, it's missing no. a lot of crucial steps but yeah, yeah, yeah. there are some really good details in <laughs> there's there. no shopping lists or anything <laughs> no. so that's just an example of some of them and then the rest of the stories like they come from my clients really so let's go down to prose and sentence structure how important is it to you to get those sentences right I had to work really, really hard to get good at prose, mm. really hard to get good at prose. And luckily now I have an editor and there's uh, one of the final edits that you go through when you're getting a book published is your editor goes through and they do a really big sweeping edit. Um, and in this case, they don't change your voice, but they might rearrange sentences. So I get to a stage now where I'm like, okay, I know this isn't working, but it'll get picked up later because when you work with the team, it's so much easier to do this stuff. But <laughs> I don't rely on that as a crutch because I still get a bit pedantic about it. But I also know it's there, so I don't have to stress too much. So when I come to writing sentences, um, I try to keep in mind the theory about uh, music, which is that prose should be like music, which means you have short sentences and long sentences. Okay. Don't have the same amount of syllables in every sentence. If something isn't working, you know, put some small sentences, put some large sentences, come at it with a rhythm. Um, remove all the words that don't need to be there. You, you find with my writing, it can be quite sparse in places. It's quite 
you know, it's, it's missing, missing words that are implied. Um, let's see if I, if we could see, see if I can find an example of that. Um, you know, like uh, uh, Ahab's eyes caught on a small figure walking up the street, a dog at its heels, a familiar dog and a familiar figure. Like a familiar dog and a familiar figure, it's quite, you know, short. And the next word is this forest, full stop. And he was walking with intent straight for the mermaid's darling. So there's kind of, I'm, I'm leaving a bit of space there to fill in the gaps. It's a good example, actually, because it speaks to Ahab's personality and the way he conducts himself. Yeah. Yeah, there's a brusqueness to it. Brusqueness, yeah. I'm looking at a bit now where he's serving the bar. He's got a bar, the mermaid's darling. Yeah. <laughs> Ahab grunted. He walked up and down the bar, serving both locals and tourists, and, as it turned out, the odd journalist. He engaged the latter in polite conversation, underscored by a slight tone of menace. They soon backed off. Ahab had that effect on people. It's good. Yeah, yeah. 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 It was fun to write. The whole thing was fun to write. I'm so lucky I get to do this. <laughs> I, writing's my favourite thing to do. It's excellent. Talking about good sentences, Kyle, the start of that particular chapter, chapter 9, Ahab, I love this. And this goes to your talent for setting. And it's not one of the beach or cave or diving scenes. Ahab stood behind the bar of the mermaid's darling, pulling a pint of stout for Ned. There were few things like the heady smell of ale, the gleam of a Tasmanian oak finish, a fireplace burning in the corner against the chill of the black wind. In the beer garden, strung with lights, 20-somethings were out in the ringing wind, drunk as skunks. That's got a beautiful musicality to it. Yeah. I'd be proud of that. Yeah, no, I am, pr- I am proud. And, and, so, and, yeah, I don't want, you know, you or the listeners to think that I'm just relying on my editor to shape these sentences later. Like, I'm still definitely pedantic about getting it right. I yeah. just don't stress because I know that if I, if I miss it, someone else will catch it up. But I was never a natural prose writer. Okay. I, I'm quite natural at story ideas and plot ideas, but prose, I had to work bloody hard at i had to work so hard to just to write good sentences now it's a bit more second nature and now i just make sure to not put too much in there to keep it sparse to let the reader fill in the gaps and just to um keep that rhythm and that momentum kind of musicality happening for anyone that wants a taste of Kyle's talent for evocative setting, you can't go past the prologue of The Deep. It's very immersive, I would say. Yes, You're rolling you. around in that kelp at the bottom yeah. of the ocean with forests being torn up against the rocks and oh, it's just great. <laughs> so you've developed a bit of a reputation for writing evocative settings, Kyle, first with The Bluffs, now with The Deep, and I have no doubt the third novel will have an evocative setting as well. I was having a look through Kate Grimble's book on writing and she says that when a character observes and describes the landscape, the mood of the landscape can reflect the character's mood and gradually draw us into the character's state of mind. Does that resonate with you? I don't know what goes on with my landscape writing, to be honest. I don't understand. I'm learning more about why it resonates with readers, but it was not nothing with my landscape consciously intentional um why do you think it resonates with readers i don't know (laughs) like i'm i don't i didn't even realize it resonated with me it wasn't until people kept saying wow i love your landscape writing that i realized how much of a connection i have to the landscape yeah i didn't know that and now i do but i i think part of it is that again the spirit you write in is the spirit that goes out with your book and when I'm writing landscape, I'm, it's a love letter to Tasmania. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, it's me at my desk wishing I was there. You know, it's me remembering the wild feel of the ocean. It's me remembering the smell of gum trees. It's me wishing I was out there in the sun and the water and the spray rather than here at my desk writing. I mean, I love be here, to be here writing, but I'm, I'm longing to be there. And that spirit is going out with my words. When I'm writing from that, it's going to come across in the words. I love that Kate Grenville, Grenville quote. I said something good in, in an interview once, and it only came to me in that interview. <laughs> Whereas I said, my characters are so kind of topsy-turvy, shapeshiftery, that I need lots of landscape to be the counterbalance to that. I need the landscape to be to ground people. I need to, to ground my characters that earthiness of the landscape, even though it's the ocean, it's still, it grounds people. There's gravity to landscape. 
and I need that in my books so that my readers don't get cast adrift. And yet, unintentionally, obviously, but it works so well as a metaphor for what's going on with the characters. You've got that menacing black wind that is an undercurrent to the whole novel, isn't it? The town is yes. either waiting for that black wind or they're suffering the after effects of that black wind. And that's just a beautiful metaphor for the menace of the drug industry yeah. that's going on that, that is the dark underbelly of the town. Yeah. And with the wind, what I wanted to do was I didn't want something that could only get you when you're on the ocean. I wanted an ocean mythos, an ocean monster, mm. but I needed it to also get you on land. And so the wind, you know, the wind is above the water. It's there when you're on the ocean, it's, it's howling and it controls the waves. But even when you're on land, it still can get into your head. It can still rattle your house and still tear tear limbs off trees and so that was that was important to me did writing the deep teach you anything new about writing craft or process apart from what we've already discussed it taught me that when i don't think something's working doesn't mean that it isn't and when then i think something's working doesn't mean that it is which is an unfortunate fact of writing and i didn't know it with the bluffs i kind of suspected it would work with the deep i was convinced i was hand on my heart convinced that it was not going to it was going to let people down i thought no one's going to like this as much as the bluffs of i'm going to lose readers i'm going to let you know the team down but i'm okay with that i just need to get this out now because i'm done i've finished it i've done all i can do and the response to the deep has been that it's better than the, the bluffs and I don't know how that happened. I don't know. I don't know. Like, I can't. I'm guessing it's to do with the interaction of the characters. I'm mm-hmm. guessing it's to do with the more adult themes. I'm guessing it's something to do with pace. But at the end of the day, I don't know what I've done right. And I still, in my heart, look at that book and think, I still think it's not as good as The Bluffs. So what, what I learned is that th- there's this frustrating displacement as a writer where you think that you know what you're doing, but you don't. And that's seductive. That's fun. That's a challenge. But it's also part of the reason that writers go a little bit crazy. Mm. You know, our mental health has does weird little backflips sometimes. We'll, we feel this, this crushing imposter syndrome and we feel this great elation almost in the same day and, and we never know why or how it's happening. Um, and I think it's fascinating. I don't know any other discipline where that happens. So that's, that's something I definitely learned yeah. with writing the deep and the release so far. Do you feel like you have to just trust the process? Is that what it comes down to? No, no. I'd like to say yes, but mm. if I'm being honest with myself, no, I don't, I don't have that in life. I have a trust the process mentality, mm. trust the journey. I believe in that. But with writing, I feel like writing is a much more mystical thing than we realize. We can talk about, the science of writing and I know a lot about the science of writing Um, and we can talk about the art of writing which we can get into in certain level but at the end of the day that's everyone's own um, their their own kind of jurisdiction we can talk about the philosophy of writing which is very fascinating I'm learning more about that and and what I I mean by philosophy is stuff like Save the Cat that's a philosophical thing it's about why do we like the people we like and that's where character comes into. But underneath it all, there's energy. There's certain energies in the creative process that we can't quantify. And I know that because I, I have to trust the energy of my character. I have to trust that the energy of, of Mac is on this page right now. What does he want to do? And I can put words about that around the craft, the art, the science, the philosophy. But also, I keep saying this, there's a certain spirit I'm in when I'm writing and I know that that spirit's what's going out with the book and I can't quantify that. I don't know why that's happening or how that's happening. And not knowing can be quite maddening because you don't know what the end result's going to look like. And so, and I mean, everyone says this, everyone like Liz Gilbert says, I wish I knew what I did right with E Pray Love. I don't know what I did right. You know, we, I wish I knew what I've done right with the bluffs and the deep. I know I provided an experience that, that readers enjoy. And for the rest of my life, I'll keep trying to provide readers with an experience. Might not be the same one, but I'm aware of how 
what I want as a reader, and I'm and I'm going to make damn sure I provide it to my readers. But I still don't I still don't know what what's going on in that deeper um, spiritual, mystical, metaphysical energy level, and I find that part of the reason I'm enjoying going to the page because you know if I can't work it out, then I you know it's it's another puzzle I'm I'm eager to to solve. You must have done something right, Kyle. <laughs> and we touched on a few things that you did do right today. So a few pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. And I think that's a great place to end our chat, although I could keep going all day. So could I, Michelle, but yes, I think it's a great <laughs> idea. Thanks so much for coming on, Kyle. I know it's probably a really busy time for you promoting The Deep. I'm going to suggest everybody go out and buy this book. Uh, tell your friends, especially your writer friends, and then get them to come and listen to the podcast because there's some absolute gold in what we chatted mm -hmm. about today. Yes, yes. I've enjoyed this chat. Thank you for thinking of me. It's a pleasure. And we'll talk again, I hope, after the next one. Yes, absolutely. There you go, the wonderful Kyle Perry. I loved our chat and I can't wait to see what he writes next. In the meantime, I've been really enjoying reading Kyle's Instagram. He's taken to sharing these gorgeous snippets of writing from his journals, just beautiful observations from his travels in Tassie and snippets of dialogue from interactions he's had with different people. And there are also some images there that relate to certain scenes and places in the deep. So it's definitely worth checking out at kyle.perry.author. And of course, The Deep is available wherever you buy your books. There's a link on my website, writersbookclubpodcast.com, where you'll also find the show notes for today's episode with Kyle, including a link to the plotting book that he mentioned, Save the Cat by Blake Snyder. Um, I've also put in a link to a post by the writer Elizabeth Gilbert, where she talks about how her mother's saying, done is better than good, has had a positive effect on her writing life. So that's worth checking out too. Uh, Kyle also talked about how much he's getting out of his masterclass subscription. So I've popped a link to that in there as well. Now to our September book. I'm changing things up this month with a switch in genre. The Prison Healer is a young adult fantasy novel by Lynette Noni, who is currently Australia's number one YA fiction author. The Prison Healer is the first in a new series that Lynette is writing, so not only do we get to talk to her about writing YA and fantasy, I'm also keen to talk about writing a series with her, as she has a couple of other series under her belt. If you or someone you know is interested in writing fantasy or a series for young adults, get yourself a copy of The Prison Healer and send me in your questions for Lynette. And of course, as always, we have a giveaway. You've got a chance to win a copy of The Prison Healer. Just head over to the Writers Book Club podcast Instagram or Facebook account to enter and maybe you'll win a copy. Entries close on September the 7th and the book will be sent out to you in plenty of time to read before the podcast. Thanks again for joining me on the podcast this month. If you're enjoying it and have a few minutes, I'd love it if you would leave a rating or review wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks to everyone who's already left a rating or review. It really does help other people who are interested in writing to find the podcast. Writers Book Club was recorded on the beautiful unceded lands of the Garigal people of the Eora Nation. Have a great month, everyone, and happy writing.